So now we have all ingredients in place to talk about the quantum key distribution. You've been waiting for this moment, right? <laughs> so let me tell you how Alice and Bob, in two distant locations, can use measurements on qubits that they receive from some external source and subsequent public communication to establish a secure cryptographic key. So the first thing Alice and Bob want to do is to convince themselves that the qubits they receive are indeed in this maximally entangled state. So they want to know that each pair is in this particular state. This is important because this state um, gives them the right kind of correlations if they choose the right kind of measurements. And correlations are important here because we want Alice and Bob to end up with identical binary strings. And uh, another thing that is very important here is this state being a pure state is disentangled from anything else. So if they have this state, they know that any measurement they perform on the qubits uh, will have outcomes that are not correlated in any way with anything, any other measurement that can be performed somewhere else by whoever. So that is of course important for security. Alice and Bob are going to convince themselves that they are dealing with this particular state by looking at correlation in X and Z basis. They know that if both of them choose to measure their qubits in the Z basis, they should get perfectly correlated identical outcomes. And if both of them choose to measure in the X basis, likewise, they should get identical outcomes. Now, if this condition is satisfied, if they indeed observe this kind of correlations, they know that the only state that can generate that kind of correlations is this particular state. Any other state will give you this different statistics. Alice and Bob, then, they will choose a random subset of pairs, and they will run a public test for this coloration, and they will use another subset of qubits to generate the secret key. So somehow the testing part and the key generation will be separated, as you will see in a moment. Now, we assume that Alice and Bob are a bit paranoid. There's nothing wrong with that. They are in the crypto business. It's a, it's a good thing to be a little bit on a careful side. And uh, they trust only things that are under the controls in the lab. So they trust the devices. They are confident that devices are working as they should be working, that um, they perform the right kind of measurements. They also have trusty random number generator. So they will have to make some random choices in this protocol, and they will rely on good random number generators. They, they trust those devices. But they don't trust anything that is outside the lab. So in particular, they don't trust this um, source of entangled qubits. Um, they prefer to consider the worst case scenario. So they think about an eavesdropper if that, in fact, is preparing those qubits and sending one qubit to Alice, another one to Bob. Now, <clears throat> they know that as soon as they convince themselves that each qubit is, in fact, in this uh, maximally entangled state, they don't mind Eve doing this. Because in this case, Eve is just doing them a favor, right? So it's just generating entangled qubits, sending one of them to Alice, another one to Bob, and gaining nothing from that game simply because she is completely disentangled from the two qubits that uh, she's producing. So in this sense, um, Eve is sort of um, only a, a passive observer, not an active participant in this process. So there's no reason whatsoever why Eve wants to do it without uh, gaining some information. So that's actually a very interesting part of this uh, whole scenario, that uh, Alice and Bob do not mind, in fact, to get the qubits from some kind of a dodgy source, because by testing for uh, those correlations and uh, making sure that they come in this maximally entangled state, they really don't care about the provenance of the qubits. All that matters is that they have the right kind of state from which they can generate the right kind of data. And having this state, they know that the outcomes <coughs> they generate will not be in any way correlated with any other measurements whatsoever that an eavesdropper may perform. So let's uh, look at the protocol now. Assume now that Alice and Bob will choose randomly and independently for, 
from each other for each incoming qubit, whether to measure it in x basis or z basis. So for each incoming qubit, they make the choice. It's a random choice, and it's independent from what the other one may be doing. And they continue like this with a sequence of measurements on many, many, many pairs of qubits that are generated by the source. And they keep the record. They keep the record of the type of the measurement they performed. So you can see this uh, in this table. In this column, Alice keeps the record of the measurements she performed. And in this column, Bob keeps the record on uh, the measurements he performed on their respective qubits. And they also keep the records of the outcome. So for example, in the first round, both Alice and Bob decided to measure their qubits in the x basis and uh, both of them registered outcome 1. Now, after completing the sequence of measurements and keeping the record, they communicate in public. So they use public communication channel. Remember, public communication channel is such that everyone can listen, but nobody can modify messages in the public channel. So whatever Alice and Bob communicate in public is indeed in public. Uh, an eavesdropper, uh, enemies, whoever knows about uh, whatever they, they communicate. So they are going to reveal in public the types of measurements they use for each incoming qubit, but they will not reveal the outcomes of the measurement, right? So that's important. So somehow, uh, after the public communication, everyone will know that Alice and Bob decided to measure xx in the first round, they decided to measure ZZ in the second round. Then Alice decided to measure X, and Bob decided to measure Z in the third round, and so on and so forth. So that becomes a public knowledge. Nobody knows about the outcomes that Alice registered apart from Alice. Nobody knows about the outcomes that Bob registered apart from Bob. The next thing Alice and Bob are going to do, they are going to discard all the data in which they use different measurements. <clears throat> they know that uh, different measurements don't give them any correlations in this particular state. They're kind of useless and, um, well, kind of useless. They may be used for uh, in some other scenarios, but for this example, assume they're useless. And uh, they are going to discard them. So in this case, they will just look at the entries where they use different uh, measurements. So for example, for the third around, you can see that they use different measurements and they discard this data. So Alice was using, uh, using x and Bob was measuring in the z basis. No good. <coughs> so they throw it away. Useless. Now they just go and see where else. Okay, here. So we have another entry where they use different measurements. Alice was using z, Bob was using x. They throw away this data. Okay, so the next step, Alice and Bob are going to agree on a random subset of the remaining data. And they are going to reveal in public the outcomes of the measurements for this subset only. So Alice and Bob um, can talk in public and uh, agree that, uh, for example, they are going to look at uh, the entry, say the second entry, and uh, tell each other the outcome of the measurement. So Alice essentially is telling Bob, look, um, in the second round, I got zero. Bob says, well, I got zero. The data is revealed in public, so they throw this away. They will not consider it for the key distribution, uh, for, the, for the generation of the key, but it is actually a valid information because it contributes to the evaluating, uh, in this case, uh, that Z tensor Z correlation. And uh, they carry on and they look at, uh, say, this entry. And Alice says, OK, um, I registered um, 0. And Bob says, well, the same, I got 0. Now, the outcome is revealed in public. So therefore, it will not enter our secret key, but uh, it contributes to evaluating the xx correlation. And then um, they just uh, say, pick up uh, this one again. Alice says, well, I registered one. Bob says, OK, I registered one. So they have another data to calculate the average value 
of the ZZ correlations and the same for say this entry here. They reveal it in public and then the outcomes will not be considered for the secret key. But those outcomes are important, right? So they communicate it in public and then this communication allows them to estimate the correlations in XX and ZZ basis. So if it is indeed the case that they see perfect correlations, that the outcomes are always identical, then they are pretty confident that the remaining data also have outcomes that are perfectly correlated, but the remaining data were not revealed in public. So they have all reasons to believe that in the first round, both Alice and Bob picked up the same measurement x, so therefore they have all reasons to believe that their data is identical. So Alice just writes on her secret piece of paper one, and she now believes that Bob has the same outcome for this particular round, so that Bob also has one, and, and, and vice versa. Bob believes that Alice has um, registered one as the outcome. And then they go to the next entry that was not revealed in public, um, say this one here in my very simplistic example. So Alice writes down zero, Bob writes down zero, and then they believe that those outcomes are correlated. And again, they were never revealed in public during this protocol, so therefore they are secret. And the same with, say, with this entry here. So this this outcome then become the cryptographic key. So Alice and Bob then say that uh, 1, 0, 1, and whatever they register later is, is their cryptographic key. So that's essentially how the key distribution works. You can see that we separated the testing for correlations from establishing the cryptographic key. The random subset of data is used to test for the correlations. And if the correlations are fine, then Alice and Bob are confident that the remaining part that was not revealed in public is also perfectly correlated. And because it was not revealed, it is indeed secret. Now, it is uh, perhaps worth adding at this point a few things that are very important here, namely that Alice and Bob have pretty good random number generators so that they can make random choices, truly random choices, of the observable to measure. If that kind of choices were in any way predictable, so that Eve would know in advance what Alice and Bob are going to measure, so she can easily prepare states. So for example, she, if she were to know that Alice and Bob are going to measure xx, she can prepare the eigenstead of x and eigenstead of x and give one to Alice and one to Bob. And likewise, if she were to know that Alice and Bob are going to measure uh, ZZ, she can prepare the eigenstates of Z, so she can give one qubit with state 0 to Bob and another uh, state with uh, bit value 0 as well to Alice. So she can certainly fool Alice and Bob if she, if she knew the, the settings for each measurement if she knew the observable that they are going to use. So therefore, it's actually quite important that those random number generators are um, something that Alice and Bob can rely on, that they generate random choices for the observables and also random choices for the subset that they are going to use um, in uh, running the public test. We also assume that Alice and Bob um, have full trust in their devices. And of course, we also assume that they have access to public channel. Now, um, one thing that uh, perhaps a minor technical thing that I should add that uh, be careful about the labels. Um, when I described this protocol, I used uh, zeros and ones. So that's how we often talk about the outcomes when we deal with binary strings. But when we <coughs> do calculations and when we use Pauli operators, we tend to use labels plus one, minus one for the outcome. So remember that there's this one one-to-one -one correspondence that uh, zero in the Pauli language is interpreted as plus one, and one in the Pauli operator language is interpreted as, as or relabeled as minus one. But that's essentially 
the quantum key distribution, and um, that's uh, how it works.